I am Brad Keeler. She is Catherine O'Sullivan. Next up on Director's Cut, we're getting close to summer. Find out some new stuff about Sam. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and that is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every single week, except for some time off in the summer and one week at the holidays, I interview a different GI member who has stories to tell. Some of them are personal, some are professional, but all of them are fun. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, after you watch this today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org, and there you will find out a lot of stuff. But one, that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, I feel very strongly that you will. You should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. Today's director's cut is a little special because we don't get to do many of these with our international members. And we have one joining us today from London, United Kingdom, where she is a faculty member, a professor of particulate soil mechanics at Imperial College London, and this summer will be the new editor-in-chief of the Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. We will talk a little bit about that later on in the interview. It is Catherine O'Sullivan. Catherine, welcome. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. We are going to have a great time. We have 10 questions, the same as we do every week, and two of them are the same that we ask everybody. We start with one of those. Describe your job in 45 seconds. So I'm what we would call a member of academic staff in Imperial College London. You would call that a faculty member, I think. Um, so there's there's some language that differences between the UK and the US, and I have to be mindful of that. So in my job, I'm teaching undergraduate students, postgraduate students. I'm involved in research, research supervision. I lead on equality and diversity in our department. So I think about those issues a lot. And then my research looks at how we link the interactions of individual particles with the overall behavior of soil. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of what I do. That was a beautiful synopsis. And I did not know the uh, diversity and inclusion piece that you mentioned there. So what what's the easiest or I guess not the easiest, but what's the most rewarding or, or the most challenging part of that aspect of your job? I think the really interesting thing about it is um, that we think about equality and diversity as being something we should do because it's the right thing to do. Okay, but if you actually look into why organizations need to be more diverse and inclusive, it's actually about what they can achieve. So countless management consultancies have looked at this. And if you've got a more diverse body of people in your organization and if they feel included, you will outperform your outperform your competitors. So as teaching engineers and as work as working as a university we want um first of all our students to have the skill set to work in in organizations that have a diverse set of employees but we ourselves also want to be as good as we possibly can be in terms of delivering our research and delivering our educational agenda so both for the well-being of the institution but also as 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 part of the education these two things are very important um, and I think it's something we need to be mindful of in professional bodies as well. So I'm sure you think about that. But there is a very clear set of evidence showing that this is this is you know not just the right thing to do. It's it's a good thing to do to improve performance. Does that make sense? It does. That was a great summary. So thank you for that. We have the fun questions on Director's Cut too. They get mixed in so that everybody has a good time as we go through here. And so we lead now with one of those. What's the worst thing you've ever spilled in your entire life? The beans. 
That, that's good. That was quick. It I links to particles. That. You know, you could imagine particles being spilled as well. So, yeah. There, there, but there was no major sand incident that you've ever had. I don't think so. Not that I can recall. I feel it. My wife would probably say this about me too. I, when we were planning our wedding, we're talking to one of the, I guess the wedding planner person. And I don't even remember what I said. And I got kicked under the table because I said something that was of course inappropriate for the scenario, the situation. And she kicked me. And my response to this is of course, ow, why are you kicking me? Um, I don't know. I, do you do chronically spill the beans or do you I don't, feel I don't like you can so. keep I, it under wraps more? I, 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 I told my son that's what I'd say and he thought it was funny. Oh, that's, that's perfect. Funny. So we're, we're guaranteed at least another viewer for director's cut. I like that. The research question is always number three in the interview and that's where we are now. I'm just going to say a couple words and it might be your job title again and let you run with it because this is this is fantastic here. Particulate soil mechanics. You were explaining before we got on how maybe we don't well, we don't have job titles that are that specific in the US for sure for for a faculty member in a department. But you're giving a keynote at EMI conference next month. A lot of GI members also are EMI members. I think this is all I'm going to lead you with. Talk about your research, why you're coming across the EMI, what you're going to do while you're there. Give the people something. So what I try to do in my research is look at the behavior of soil at the scale of the particles and their interactions and relate that to the overall behavior of soil. And I started off working in discrete element modeling over 20 years ago as one of the first people um, working in that compared to the vast number of people doing it now. And at the beginning, I was really looking at the numerical method, and then that involved into looking at sand behavior. So I've looked at the state parameter framework developed by Jeffries and Bean, and, and looking at um, how we can use DEM to, 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 to better understand the applicability of that method to generous stress states. Um, I've also done work looking at small strain stiffness and laboratory geophysics. So trying to understand how surface roughness of particles affects the overall stiffness, looking at how we can use these simulation tools to develop new laboratory approaches to, to measure stiffness. Also looking at internal erosion, which is very important for embankment dams and flood embankments. Um, and I'm still working in that area. More recently, I've been looking a lot at coupled problems, so fluid particle interaction, really trying to see how we can develop a very good way to simulate fluid flow efficiently when we're explicitly modeling the interactions between the individual grains, because I think that can really help us to look ultimately at liquefaction, which is very, very important, obviously, in the, the seismic areas of the US. So I think that's relevant to, to your members. And then um, more recently, I've been looking at clay, so I've had a couple of PhD students looking at how can we create particle scale models of clay? How can we develop efficient ways to model the geometry of clay particles? And what do we need to do to accurately simulate the interactions between the individual grains? Because clay is much more complicated than sand. The particles interact even when they're not touching. And the shape of the relationship between the separation distance and the interaction force is, is quite complex. So they're the kind of things I'm doing. And what I really think the challenge is for people who do the kind of work I do is trying to understand how we can take these tools, which really have been under development since the 70s and 80s, and now they're, they're at a point where they're relatively mature. And how can we transition from showing that these tools can capture soil uh, behavior to using them to do something really innovative and advanced geotechnical engineering practice. And I feel that's the, the kind of threshold of where I am now in terms of trying to see how can we do that um, and really make a difference for, for geotechnical engineering. So I have about 15 follow-up questions here, and we're probably not going to ask all 15 because that would take all day. Do you find yourself being to, to go back to something you said at the very end of that, do you find yourself being a little bit of an evangelist then, um, both in terms of 
maybe getting other people in the community to adopt some of the same modeling that you've been working on. But also, one thing that you mentioned before we started today was uh, about getting this into applied research. I, I would assume getting it specifically to industry. Do you feel like you have to have a little bit of an evangelist role in what you do then? Maybe. I mean, my, my so in terms of getting uptake in the research community, that, that bridge has been crossed. It, it, this is now a very accepted tool in geotechnical yeah. research. I, 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 you know, we saw that at the Geo Congress. It was mentioned in many of the, the keynotes, this tool, discrete element modeling. Where um, I think is the challenge, and, and I think we're, we're starting to see that being overcome actually at the Geo Congress, is getting getting it used in a way um, that's, that, that's having an impact an impact on practical engineering. So I, I hadn't thought of myself as being a very applied person, but when I, I gave a keynote at um, the TC105 conference in Atlanta, I think it was in 2019, I was introduced as being someone who was quite applied because at the time I was talking about using these tools to look at um, designing filters for embankment dams and looking at how we uh, minimize the risk of internal erosion. So I'd identify those as two problems where this tool set could be usefully applied. But I think we need to find more of that type of problem because, you know, we can't keep, um, and I guess I, I think more about my role in, in looking at journal papers and publications, we can't keep showing that the tool uh, can capture soil behaviour. We need to do, well, it can capture soil behaviour and then and what's the next thing it can do? What can it do to achieve innovation in geotechnical engineering or make our design codes more robust or go look at maybe um, conditions that we can't easily achieve in the laboratory? So it's very difficult to have um, a non-triaxial stress pace and go to very large strains. It's hard to do, but we can do that easily in our tools. So it's just kind of art identifying and then articulating where are the knowledge gaps and where are the, the opportunities where we can apply this, this to? That's great. I wanted to ask you also about, uh, we'll go back earlier in the answer to computational fluid dynamics. How much, I know this is very important, especially in the aerospace community, CFD is used heavily there too. How much have you guys been able to pull from the way other disciplines have used CFD um, in your work? Um, so, so what we're doing with CFD to some extent is relatively simple because we always look at laminar flow. Um, but we routinely use open foam, which is um, a general purpose CFD code. Um, and we're, 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 we're taking open foam, which might have been developed for applications in aerospace engineering. And instead of looking at the plane as being the body that the fluid goes around, we're looking at individual sand grains. And in so doing, we can get a good understanding um, of what are the actual forces on the individual particles when fluid flows through. And then what I'm particularly interested in is poor network modeling, which is a technique used in petroleum engineering, where you model the pore space as a network. And your voids are the nodes, the, the throats between the voids are the edges. And what we've shown by using open foam and fully resolved computational fluid dynamics, we've shown that we can adapt these poor network models in such a way that we can accurately predict the fluid particle interaction forces. And I think that's very important because I think that's a tool that you could then go to look at liquefaction with. Because for to look at, liqui at, at, at dynamic liquefaction, you need to be able to simulate quite a complex um, stress history, a dynamic stress history, and then also model the fluid flow and the forces on the individual particles. So we're kind of looking at fluid mechanics in general and then specifically at what they do in petroleum engineering. Well, that is perfect. I feel like we got to touch on a lot of different things there, which is good because I'm looking through the questions and usually I go back to the research at some point in the interview and we're not doing it today. So I'm glad we got to uh, get a lot of that stuff out in that question. Next thing I want to ask, I, and there's a there was a reason for this. So I think a lot of people, especially the students who watch this, see a lot of people either at any point in their careers and think, oh, this person's amazing. I've read their work. They must have just sailed through everything to get where they are today. And they're such a high achiever that there's no way anything ever went wrong for them. 
So I wanted to put this question in here. I've never done this before. What was your biggest setback in your schooling and how did you overcome it? Well, I kind of thought that the motivation for your question might be what it actually is. And what we haven't talked about is the fact that I'm Irish. Um, so um, I grew up in, in Cork, which is the second city in the Republic of Ireland. And I went to university in Cork because most Irish people at the time anyway, went to the university that was closest to their house. And, um, you know, I, I, I liked civil engineering and I was, you know, on the more academic end of it. I wasn't very good at technical drawing, but I was pretty good at math. So I thought, well, probably a career in research would be good for me. And, and doing a PhD is something I, 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 I would enjoy. So I went to this briefing they had in the university about going to grad school in the US because I thought I'd like to do that. And they said, well, you can't go to grad school um, unless you can write you know, some kind of research proposal about what you would do when you were there. And I sat there thinking, I'm in fourth year. I don't know what current research is. And um, I th thought, well, you know, th that's that. I, I, you know, obviously I'm not good enough because I can't come up with a research idea. Um, um, and then a couple of months later, I saw an advertisement for the University of California uh, Education Abroad Program. So they send students from the University of California to Ireland and it's reciprocated. So some Irish students could go back. And I applied for that saying I would follow some grad courses at Berkeley. Um, and, and I managed to get that scholarship and pull together some other scholarships to go to Berkeley as an exchange student. Um, and, and that was the beginning of my career in, in getting a postgraduate qualification in geotechnical engineering and then going forward into into PhD studies and eventually ending up as an academic. But I, th I think the thing I would say is, I think it's totally unreasonable and I would never expect a fourth year student to come up with their own research plan. So I think if you're interested in grad school and you're interested in the UK, you can come directly to a PhD. I would say approach an academic, a member of academic staff, um, send them an email, say you're interested in what they do in general, and if they're interested in you, they'll probably ping back some ideas and you'll exchange some emails and have some chats. And out of that will come an idea. But not to feel intimidated by thinking, well, I'm only at the beginning of my career. I need to know what the current hot topic is. You don't. And we will work with people. And, and that was my experience at Berkeley too. The staff there worked with me um, to come up with ideas for a PhD. So hopefully that's helpful. An important point to put at the end of this, I, I feel like all of us who went to grad school probably encountered somebody along the way who was not the most supportive and the most encouraging. I feel like my advice to people when they talk about things like that, if they feel overmatched or feel defeated, is you probably shouldn't be working with that person. Um, if they are making you feel that way, there's going to be somebody else you can find who's going to help you along. I, yeah, but I don't think I ever met anyone who, who did that to me. I think these were well-meaning people trying to help Irish students get into grad school in the US, but I don't think they necessarily knew what they were talking about. <laughs> um, so that's slightly different. Sometimes people give advice maybe when they're not the best person to give that advice. So, you know, I, I guess I would say go talk to someone else. And it's important for people like me to say, you know, you don't need to have that research proposal when you're starting on the journey. You need to start having conversations. And, and you're completely right. If someone says no, send an email to someone else. Um, so I don't think I really have a good place to ask this anywhere along the way. So we're just going to do it now. This is one of the dreaded bonus questions that come up in Director's Cut. Now that you've been, uh, you know, on the, the UK and the Irish side and the American side, what do you feel like within the research community specifically are the biggest cultural differences? I mean, for our viewers, full disclosure, I spent many years working at the British Embassy on science and innovation work. And one of the things that we focused on was the cultural differences between the two countries because we felt that it was significant sometimes, especially in things like starting companies, spinning out companies from new technology, um, vastly different success rates in the US and UK, and uh, there were cultural issues at the root of that. So what have you noticed as you've gone through your career? I think, I think it's different. I'm aware of some of the cultural differences in the enterprise spectrum, because The Economist recently wrote something about that. So it's quite different. Um, the thing that strikes me most is um, 
the support for women who have children is much greater in the UK. I'm really shocked when I talk to female faculty in the US um, about what they need to do to keep their careers going when they have small children. So, you know, everybody here gets at least 16 weeks off work completely. Um, and then you can take extra time up to a year where you, you don't come to work. Um, so in my own case, I think I took five months off. My husband then got uh, was relieved from his job for, for a while to look after a child. And then when I came back to work, I didn't have to teach for six, another six months. I had a fellowship and anyone in Imperial College who goes on maternity leave or a, a, a man who takes uh, paternity leave to look after their child, they're then entitled to apply for these fellowships where they can just focus on their research so they don't, or the, the, their research momentum is not as effective as it would be if you know they were trying to come back and teach with a small child. So that to me, I've not seen any US um, university where, where that level of support is offered. I mean, people seem to say they were relieved for teaching for one semester, but I hear stories of people bringing quite small children into work. And we don't have to do that and we're not expected to. And I think that's a big difference. And I think it makes a huge difference for, for women managing having a family and also for, for men managing having small children and getting a chance to spend spend time with their kids. That That's much easier to do here. Um, so that's that's a cultural difference that I'm, I'm very mindful of, um, especially after having talked to quite a lot of people at the recent Geo Congress. So I'm not sure if that's what you expected, but. Um, no, it's a great answer, though. It's I, I think, you know, obviously this isn't a live show, but I can almost hear the cheering in the background of our academic community to push for something similar here, because it's I think across the board. Um, I, I look yeah. at the paternity leave I got, for example, and it was virtually non-existent to compared to what I would get many, many other countries. Yes, yeah, so I gave a talk about this in Georgia Tech in 2020, just before COVID, and the slides from it are on my web page, and that links into quite a lot of the work that the Royal Academy of Engineering has done on diversity. And I think if you're interested in that in the engineering context, take a look at those slides, and I think they signpost some of the interesting work that's being done in the UK in that space, which I think is, you know, I think I think the US does a lot of really, really good things on diversity and inclusivity that, um, especially in the area of different ethnic backgrounds or different races that maybe we're not quite um, as tuned into. Um, but I think in, in terms of, of looking at uh, gender equality, um, the, the, the UK, has got a slightly different way of, of looking at it that may be that may be useful to people to, to be aware of. Well, that's great. We can link to that in the show notes. So if you are interested viewers, the link is right below the window that you're watching this video in now. I have to ask a question about Sir Alex Skempton. Your office is in the Skempton building, I believe. I think many American geotechs will know his name. They might know a little bit about him, but he certainly doesn't have the profile here that Carl Terzaghi or Ralph Peck has. So I wanted to ask you, what's something that all American geotechnical engineers should know about Sir Alex Skempton? Well, I should say I did not know Professor Skempton. Um, one of my first trips to Imperial College was to the memorial conference that was run after he, he died. So, um, um, I, you know, so so I, I'm not very, very familiar with his work. What I really like, though, is the fact that our building is called after uh, Professor Skempton and not after a donor. And I don't think we would ever change that. People have a very strong sense of affiliation to that. Um, but one of the areas of research I've been involved in, as I've already mentioned, is internal erosion. And one of the last papers that Professor Skempton wrote was a paper that shows that under quite low hydraulic radians, hydraulic radians of as low as 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, you can get particle movement if you have a gap graded soil. And he worked with an undergraduate fourth year student to carry out a series of experiments that were then published in Geotechnique to show this. Um, and it's very, very important if you're involved in, in levee design um, or, or, or embankment dam design or risk assessment to, to know that if you've got a gap graded material, Terzaghi's equation may not be directly applicable. 
Um, so first of all, there's that technical point. And the second point that I find very interesting is he he developed this paper, which has had a huge impact in the field of internal erosion, working with a very simple experiment with a fourth year student. And he was able to you know, change the way we think about something. And I think that must reflect the fact that he had such a good understanding of how to do science and also the behaviour of soil, that he was able to achieve that with, you know, very limited resources. Um, so I, I find that interesting. And that's the bit of his research that has impacted my work the most. Oh, that was great. So I, I think everybody's going to have to do a little work and learn a little bit more about him now after watching this. The other question that we ask everybody when they come on Director's Cut is how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? And I'm looking forward to this because you have one of the most divergent answers I think that we've had yet. So go for it. Well, I, I think um, as we've already, we had a little chat beforehand. I have not been that involved in the ASC and the GI. I'm a member of the ASC, but there's not a chapter of the ASC that I'm aware of in London. So my, my involvement with the ASC is really through being involved with the journal and I've been an associate editor and then an editor over the past decade. But my involvement with professional engineering institutions is quite a lot. Um, I'm a, a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, which is the professional body for civil engineers in the UK. Um, and I'm also a fellow of Engineers Ireland. So then within the Institution of Civil Engineers, I've been on the committee of the British Geotechnical Association. And I ran the Rankin Lecture as the organising person for that for three years, about a decade ago. And I've also been involved with the British Dam Society. And then in Engineers Ireland, I, I ran the, the, the London um, division of that for a few years, again, about a decade ago. Um, and that involved, you know, getting Irish engineers together and linking a bit with the embassy in London because they they, they connect to a professional body. So, so that's been my invo involvement with professional bodies. But so not with the ASCE, but with other engineering bodies that are a bit more active in, in London. This is typically where we make a pitch out to the viewers about something. And in this case, it's going to be something I usually say to a Canadian group or an American group about the Canadians. Just because you're an ASCE member does not preclude you from being an ICE member or a BGA member. You can do both. We will not be offended. We will even happily help you figure out how you can be a member in both societies. It will really enrich your career. So we can put some links to that below this video as well. As we have mentioned many times now throughout the interview, I think many times, maybe only a few, you are Irish, not British. So for everybody watching, Irish, not British, in case you can't differentiate the accents. So I had to ask an Irish question in here. And Director's Cut comes back to three things all the time, food, sports, and music. So we had to get to one of these eventually anyway. What is the most Irish thing that you eat? Well, I always drink Barry's tea, which is a tea blended in cork, which you can actually get very easily in London because it's very nice. So it's seen as a kind of a gourmet uh, drink item, I guess, here. So, so I drink Barry's tea all the time. I really like Irish brown bread. It's not that easy to get good brown bread outside Ireland, but luckily I live fairly close, so I, I can go there very easily. And then I don't like potatoes. So I'm one of the very, very few Irish people who don't like potatoes. That's like an Italian saying they don't like pasta, I think. So. Were you That's horrified at the perception of Irish food when you came to the U.S.? Yeah, it was a bit outdated because I think it was a bit like corned beef and mashed potatoes. But actually, Irish food is really, really good. And interestingly, you get very good vegetarian food in Ireland. There's there's some really good vegetarian restaurants and that impacts other, other um, you know, non-vegetarian restaurants tend to use vegetables in a really interesting way. You know, the tourist industry is really important in Ireland. The weather's not necessarily very good. So, you know, you need to have good restaurants to go into out of the rain, I think. So you get very good food in Ireland. And, you know, my husband's sick of me saying, you know, once you go outside the big cities in Ireland, you still get very good food. England, it's not always the case. I have no comment on that. I spent a lot of time in Swindon over that time that uh, that I worked for the oh, that's That's the height of um, excitement, yes. There's a, Swindon's got a lot to offer. That's how I'll, sure I'll make my save sure there. Yeah. 
Another question I've never asked, and this is not lottery related, I swear. It was more of a superstition kind of thing, I guess. But which numbers are most significant to you? Are there any that are significant to you? It depends on the day. Today, it's the uh, exam marks, which would be grades of my undergraduate students because I've spent most of the day marking exams. So, yeah, looking to see how they're doing. That's great that those are significant to you and not just to the students, though. That's Oh, yeah, probably more to me, actually. But I'm anyway. <laughs> I, I you're guess looking at it the is overall of the overall picture, though. You know, I'm, I'm, and I I'm guess it can all be a reflection on how you did your job too. I didn't, I didn't think about that aspect. <laughs> we mentioned a couple of times, and right off the top, we mentioned that this summer you're going to become the editor in chief of JGGE, the Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. For those of you out there not in the know, you should go check that out. I don't know what I would think if I were named editor in chief of, of a scholarly publication. And so that's why I worded this question this way. What terrifies you the most about being named editor in chief? Well, I don't think it's terrifying because if it was terrifying, I wouldn't do it. I think I had an option to say no. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's an absolute privilege and an honor to be asked. Um, you know, I, I thought Rod was calling me to ask me to step down as an editor. And um, I had told my husband that and then um, I had to tell him something else, which is because, you know, it's a time commitment. It, it, it will affect other things I can do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's it's fantastic to have been given this opportunity. Um, it's the first time the, the journal has had an editor based outside of the US. Um, and it's also the first time they've had a female editor. So there are two firsts. Um, which is is very significant, I think. And going back to my my comments about diversity earlier on, I think that's um, that's very important. Um, and so that played into my decision to, to accept the the invitation. Um, and you know, it, it, it's daunting, um, but it, it's clear to me it's a leadership role. And, and what I can see is I have to have a clear vision of where I want to go and what I want to do, but. It's not, you know, it's not my journal. It's the journal of the Geo Geo Institute and the community. And it's, you know, how do I interact with the other um, people who who have a are stakeholders, if you like, in the journal, and ensure that I'm listening to what they say and I'm taking their opinions on board in a, in a in a in a in a way that's appropriate and productive. And that's a bit challenging because I'm based in London, so I'm not bumping into people. Um, and, you know, a lot of conversations happen and uh, that are useful when you meet people face to face. So, you know, it's very important for me that to go to the Geo Congress and to try to get to the US a couple of times a year outside of that. Um, and I think I think we're at a, a point where um, it was very much emphasized again at the Geo Congress that generative AI has come along and that poses a particular challenge to um, uh, academic publishing. Um, and so in a way, it's an exciting time to be involved in, in a journal. And also, I, I can imagine there will be stressful decisions to be made in that space. Um, but the clear the clear thing we want to do is make sure that we continue to, to publish papers that have scientific rigor, that are novel, that are significant, and have you know, a flagship journal for the GI that's recognized internationally, because I think that's very, very important for the international geotechnical community, but also for the ASC, that's that that journal is to some extent their public face. You know, people in London, they're not they don't know about the GI, but they do know about that journal and their opinions about American civil engineering and American geotechnical engineering are for are are framed by that journal in particular. And I know that from talking to people in the pub in London for over over years. So, you know, it, it, it is important. Um, and I would emphasize that in, in those are conversations happen with people who don't know have anything to do with it. So I think it's, it's very important. Well, for all those reasons and more, we are thrilled to have you as the incoming editor in chief. And obviously all the support we can offer from staff and ASCE and GI will we'll give you and from the rest of the volunteer leadership. We're really excited. It's gonna, it's gonna be you. a good, good several years. Journals in good hands. We made it through the entire interview without asking a question about London. And so we must close with that as question number 10. What spot in London makes you the happiest? 
I, I really like the area of London where I live. I live I live near the river in West London. It's about five or six miles from campus, so I can cycle every day. And um, I cycle along by the river for a chunk of that journey. And um, yeah, it's really nice. It's calm, but yet we're on the edge of the city. And I must say as well that, um, you know, London is a terrific city. Um, and we do have a very vibrant geotechnical engineering community there. And one thing that we'd really like is to get more grad students from the US. So if anyone's thinking about either doing an MSc or a PhD um, and they'd like to maybe have a different cultural experience, we would really welcome you with open arms at Imperial. And we run one year MSc programs in what we call soil mechanics, but it's, it's effectively geotechnical engineering. And obviously we have got a, a very well recognized uh, PhD program. And, you know, that my, I've got colleagues who are, um, you know, really well recognized. And in particular, Lydia Drakovic, who's our head of group, she's going to be giving the Rankin lecture next year. So, and that's another thing I should say, you know, people are also very welcome to come to the Rankin lecture. It's held every March. It's a really big event. Um, it's run by the Institution of Civil Engineers, but we actually have it at Imperial College because so many people want to come. The rooms in the Institution of Civil Engineers can't really take the volume of, of, of people who'd like to hear the lecture. So we have it at Imperial. We run a, a research seminar beforehand where we invite people to speak. Um, so that happens in the afternoon. And then in the evening, there's the Rankin lecture, there's the Rankin dinner. People who don't go to the dinner go to the pub. It's a great day. So, you know, anyone who wants a, a trip to London in mid-March, come to the Rankin events. And, um, you know, as I said already, we, we'd really like to have more um, grad students from North America to um, improve the diversity of our student base. And also London's fun and it would be nice for other people to experience that. And on top of everything that you said, uh, Imperial's a pretty good university too. That can sell itself if everybody starts Yeah, yeah, you, you can look at the rankings there. and we don't do that badly. That is fantastic. You made it through all 10 questions, Catherine. Congratulations. I, I say that at the end of every one of these, but it's still a feat, even if you make it through. Director's Cut can be a little murderous with those bonus questions in there. For our viewers, if you liked what you saw today and you're here at the end, so you probably did, click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will, of course, let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel, which is frequently. Catherine, thank you again for doing this. I hope it was a good time. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And for all of our viewers, just a few more episodes of Director's Cut left to go before our summer break. We will have another one of those in just seven days. So we'll be back next week with a brand new episode of Director's Cut. <laughs>